Good morning. I'm going to ask you as you're able, if you will, let's stand and begin to worship together this morning.
may be seated. Holy is the Lord. We serve such a mighty king. Oh, we are so excited to have all y'all here with us today on this beautiful day. Welcome to those of you joining us online. Um, I am ne- I am always like, I always think it's going to slow down around here and it never seems to. So without further ado, I'm going to go ahead and turn your attention to the screen so we can check out the announcements. Watch this. Sorry guys, caught me at a bad moment. I was busy uh, parkouring, um, it's okay. Um, on select Saturday mornings, we're starting our Ray of Hope ministry where we're um, making ramps for people with mobility issues to get access into and out of their homes. Um, we would love for all of you to help us. Um, if you have any questions or you don't know how to use power tools, don't worry, we've got plenty of people that can teach you. And um, I'm excited to see all of you there. And on that note, let me get back to parkouring. Sam, I didn't see you there. Uh, okay. hello. Are you excited for Back Church Sunday, September seventeenth? Uh, I'm absolutely stoked. Yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah. What did you say that they were gonna have again? Um, uh, there's inflatables. Yeah. There's food trucks. Yeah. Uh, games. People need to bring a chair. Okay. Uh, and and all that stuff. Hey, I'm really high up. Can you like get? Some, I need yeah, to get for down. sure. Just give me just a second. Um, yeah, guys. September seventeenth. Um, after church. We hope we see you all there. Come hang out with us. You can drop. Well, thanks. <laughs> Hey everybody, just here to let you know, September 18th from five to seven, we are having a spirit night at Chick-fil-A over in Pea Ridge for our Night to Shine Spirit Night. We hope we see all of you there. I'll be there, I'll be happy, I'll be excited to see you. Can you just, just real quick, can you bring it down? It makes me look like I'm up higher. Oh. Just, yeah, just go down a little bit. Yeah, thanks. But anyways, five to seven, um, Night to Shine Spirit Night at Chick-fil-A down in Pea Ridge. We hope to see all of you there, just a little bit lower. Yeah, cool. Yeah. Anyways, we hope to see you guys there. We shouldn't be doing parkour. Oh, get connected with us on our Facebook page, website, YouTube, Instagram, all those things. Download the app, Google Play Store, Apple App Store. I'm gonna go find a doctor. I'll see you next week. Parkour, P A R K O U R. Just so you know, no tables were injured in the filming of this video. So uh, we want to, uh, I want to say a word of welcome to you also. So good to see you here at Woodbine Church on this uh, beautiful Sunday. Uh, we have uh, several things, uh, well, more than several things going on, as you can tell. Uh, we want to, before we get into our prayer time, I just would like to share with you a little short, and it will be short, report from uh, our annual conference. Uh, we had the, our very first ever uh, annual conference this past uh, Thursday and Friday uh, and Saturday. And at that annual conference, what that is, that's a meeting of all the churches in uh, South Alabama and uh, the Panhandle of Florida that are part of the new denomination, the Global Methodist Church. Uh, we had a great time of celebration. Uh, we had uh, a lot of uh, time of worship. Matter of fact, the business section of our annual conference took about an hour. And the rest of the time was a celebration and a worship time. We heard fantastic preaching. We heard uh, uh, we were challenged by the preachers that were there and who shared in, uh, the gospel. Uh, and it was just a phenomenal time. There were 39 pastors uh, who were ordained this past year. I've never I've been in I've been to 45 to 50 conferences. I've never seen that many pastors ordained for ministry uh, at one annual conference. So that was fantastic. Not only that, we. Um, we heard a, a report the, uh, the Global Methodist Church is only about 16 months old. Uh, but uh, it, has been, uh, it has become one of the fastest growing um, Methodist type denominations uh, in the world already. Uh, there are churches that are continually joining every week. Uh, there are pastors who are joining the denomination every week. As a matter of fact, our annual conference, uh, we are already in the process in the next year of planning 10 brand new churches. Um, and so, yeah. So... We are excited about that. Uh, not only are we planting those 10 churches, the goal of the whole uh, Global Methodist Church is to plant 3,500 new 
uh, global churches uh, in the, within the next few years. So it is just a lot of things are, are just happening that are just phenomenal. God is really doing a great work. Uh, I came back from the annual conference energized, and uh, uh, there was just the, the Holy Spirit was there, and he filled the place up, and he filled us up and sent us back out. And what a joy. So I just want to let you know what, what all happened. I usually don't do an annual conference report because it's before, it just hadn't been that much fun, honestly. <laughs> and now it is so exciting to see what God is doing and how he is working. And uh, uh, so uh, continue to pray for this brand new denomination that is growing and developing right before our eyes. God's got some great things in store for us. Uh, as we get ready for our prayer time, I want to share with you a couple of things. Uh, if you would like for us to pray for you, you just need to let us know. Uh, we have this little slip of paper that's both in your bulletin and in the back of the, the seats there. Uh, you can take that. Everybody can fill out the top part, the middle part. There are a few questions you can answer. The bottom part is where you let us know what your prayer request is. You fill that out. You drop that in the offering basket at the end of the service and uh, as you're leaving the service. And we will get those. They will come into the staff, and we'll pray over you and pray for you specifically. We read all of those. Uh, you can also let anybody on staff know that you have a prayer request for us. You can go through the app. There's a link in our app that will uh, show you where you can uh, send uh, your prayer request. Those joining us online, you can also uh, click the link up under this feed, and you can send us your prayer request, and we'll pray for you. Um, as we have. Uh, uh, I want to invite you to pray for Brent Sorrell's uh, brother, Clint. Uh, he fell uh, from about 20 feet up uh, at work. He is in very critical condition, in intensive care uh, up north. I, and I forgot where you said, uh, in Michigan? Is that right? Up in Michigan. So uh, be in prayer for, uh, that, uh, for Clint as he is um, uh, in very, very critical condition after his fall. Uh, we also want to invite you to let you know we have a baptism this afternoon. It's uh, going to be at a creek. Uh, we are going to be meeting at uh, Living Truth Church and going from there to a creek for a baptism. And we would love to have you meet us there uh, so that we can uh, leave right after 3 o'clock. So meet us there by 3 o'clock so we can go and caravan out to the baptism. And we invite you to share that great celebration for, with Todd uh, Cannon and as he is being baptized uh, today. But uh, it is just uh, what a joy to be able to go do that. But if you don't know where Living Truth Church is, if you just go up Shemukla about 11 and a half miles, there will be a big sign out there it's on the left saying, Living Truth Church, turn and meet us in their parking lot. And... Then just follow us to the creek. I can't tell you how to get there. All right. Uh, so just, just trust me. Follow us to the creek. And uh, it will be a great time of celebration. Uh, if you would like to join me for a time of prayer, I want to invite you to slip out of your seat. Uh, there's plenty of room at this altar for you. Will you join me here as we pray together? Our precious Father and our loving God, what a joy it is to know that we can always know that you are with us. What a joy it is to know of the comfort and strength that you bring to us when we're facing our most difficult times. We thank you that you walk with us and we are never alone. We thank you that you're with Clint right now. And we thank you that you're with his family as they're so deeply concerned about him. We do pray for your healing there. We thank you that we get an opportunity to celebrate baptism. And we thank you for the new life that that represents and the commitment people have made to follow you with their whole heart. So we thank you for that. We thank you, Heavenly Father, for the assurance that you love us so much we thank you for this uh, annual conference that just finished yesterday for the opportunity we had together and to worship and to grow together as believers and I thank you for 
the pastors and the delegates who came to that conference as they have gone home and as they've gone back into their churches and their worship settings I thank you that you are with them there as they are gathering on this day I thank you for the move of the spirit at the annual conference I pray that that would continue and I pray that it would spread. I pray for that spirit, that Holy Spirit to continue to move in all churches, Father. Not just the ones in our denomination, but all churches. I pray, Heavenly Father, that you would just do a work in all churches. I pray, Father, that each and every church, that they would be open to the moving of your spirit. I pray, God, that souls will be saved and lives will be changed. All around us today, there are churches gathering of different denominations. But I thank you that every Christian church, as it gathers today, we gather in worship of one God, and that is you. So, Lord, have your way. Have your way in this service. Have your way in the services of every church. And may you be glorified always. Father, you are the first and the greatest giver. Everything we have comes from you. And we give you thanks today. For it's in your name we pray. Amen. <clears throat> if you are new with us today, uh, I want to welcome you. I want to welcome everybody. But if you're new and you're checking us out, I want to invite you to do what we call Stick for Six. Uh, and what that is, is, we invite you to stick with us for six Sundays. We understand that something may happen and you're not able to go for six straight Sundays. We get that. But stick with us for six Sundays and get to know a little bit more about who we are. And uh, we'll uh, hopefully get a chance to get to know you better if you'll let us uh, do that. Uh, but, uh, you know, each Sunday is different. There's something else going on uh, each and every week. And so we invite you to check us out for those six Sundays. Um, <clears throat> we want to... Uh, share with you that your financial support continues to keep the ministry going here around uh, our community and through Woodbine Church. Uh, we thank you so much for that support that you give to us and give to the Lord through, his, through this ministry. Uh, any offering that you brought with you today, you can drop that in the offering baskets as you leave uh, the service in a few moments. Uh, you can also go through our um, Woodbine Church app and there's a way you can give there. There is a QR code up on the screen. You can scan that code. It'll carry you to a link where you can give. There's a text to give number in your bulletin and those of you joining us online uh, there is a link below this feed where you can give. Um, God's given us everything that we have and we have an opportunity to invest back to Him what He's given, a portion of what He's given to us. And so thank you for your generosity. I want to remind all of our youth at the end of this next song, you're invited to go out into the atrium and meet Trey to go to your uh, connect group and life group. So uh, at, after this song, join him in the atrium. Let's continue in our service.
forget, Lord, that in the stillness is where you are, Lord. That stillness means surrendering our circumstances to the cross. And Father, I just ask that those of us who sometimes struggle to take the things back that we've supposedly handed over to you, Father, that that we would just let them remain there at the foot of the cross. That is where the resolution is, Father. That is where you are. Lord, we thank you so much for this day. Father, we thank you for the opportunity to come together as a body to worship, Lord, to lift up your name and praise as we celebrate the joys that we've experienced this week and the joys going on in our lives. And Father, and just lay the difficulties and the struggles at your feet because life is complicated, Lord, but you are walking with us through all of it. And for that, we are so grateful. And Father, we are just, our heart is broken for those who do not know that relationship with you. And so, Father, we ask that you would use this word that you put on the heart of our pastor, Father, to embolden us and motivate us, to inspire us, to share that good news, to tell the people that we love that you love them. Father, to have the courage to tell strangers who need to know about you, about what knowing you and being in relationship with you can do to just completely transform their lives. So, Father, we give you this time with great anticipation and look forward to what you have for us today. In your son's precious and holy name, amen. Amen. I want to uh, share with you that starting next week, we're going to start a uh, brand new series called One Step Away and uh, invite you to be a part of that series uh, as we are jumping neck deep into that study. Uh, So... um, Uh, we, what we've been doing over these past few weeks uh, in this series, the first Sunday we talked about what it means to come to faith in Christ, and the sun, the ser- sermons from that series, from the, uh, from the beginning, that first one all the way to now, we've been talking about the process of discipleship, what it means to, to be a full, fully devoted follower of Jesus. And I want to just remind you what those are. Uh, the, the, in our you know, church, we have five areas that you can measure for yourself to see where you are in your discipleship. And if you remember it with you, you know, I've done this many times, but I want to do it again. Make sure we're together on it since we're wrapping up this, this series today. Uh, our thumb sets us apart from all the rest of the entire animal kingdom. Uh, and it... It reminds us that since we are set apart, that Jesus Christ came and he died for us. He didn't die for all the animals. He didn't, you know, I'm not saying he don't love animals, but he didn't die for them. He died for us. And since that sets us apart, we need to realize one of the most important things we can do is spending time reading the Bible and praying and make it a habit to do that every day. And you know how, where you are in that. The next finger, our pointer finger, whenever we see something important 
we point at it. If we want to make sure people know about it, we'll, we'll tell them about it. And if it's there, we'll point at it. Well, our pointer finger reminds us of worship. And when we hold our finger up like this, it reminds us that we worship God and God alone. So being a part of, a worship, of the worship setting here at uh, the church is very important. It's a part of our discipleship. You know how often you're here. So you can measure that yourself. Then if we go to the third finger, that third finger is in the middle of our hand. And that middle finger there reminds us to be centered. It's our center finger. It reminds us to be centered. To help us get centered and stay centered is we invite people to get to be a part of a connect group. That way you're in a smaller group, you're able to grow together, you're able to talk together and learn together, and you get connected together. So it's important, it'll keep you centered. The ring finger is about serving because serving has a ring to it. And when we're serving, we're doing what God's called on us to do, using whatever gifts, whatever talents, whatever abilities. Uh, sometimes our greatest ability is availability. You know, being there. And so uh, that reminds us to serve. So, you know, where are you in your Bible reading and your prayer life? Where are you in your worship attendance? Where are you in being a part of a life group? Where are you in serving? You know how to measure where you are because you know. You know you. The last finger is whenever I introduce myself to someone, I reach out my hand and I shake their hand. That little finger, when it, we open up our whole hand, it reminds us, as Christ followers, we are to introduce people to Jesus. So we're starting today with making introductions. We're talking about that today. Now, as we're doing that, I want to remind you that next Sunday is back to church Sunday. For some folks, they've been out of church, and they haven't, we have an opportunity to invite them back to church. For other folks... They might not ever go to church or might not have been very much or, you know, uh, we have an opportunity to invite people to go to church. It takes less than 20 seconds to invite somebody to church. Now, I don't know how many seconds there are in a day. But I spend more than 20 seconds drinking sweet tea. I would suggest that we take that 20 seconds or more and, and multiple times during the day. Hey, listen, I, I don't know if you have a church. I, I'll tell you how I do it. I do it at, the, I do it at restaurants. I do it at the, whenever they're, uh, I'm paying for my stuff at a convenience store. Uh, I've done it at Walmart. I've done it at all these places. It's very simple. Hey, I don't know if you have a church home, but I, I attend Woodbine Church on Woodbine Road. It's the church with a green sign. We have services at 9 and 11. I'd love to invite you to come if you haven't got a church home. See? Doesn't take long, does it? I don't tell them I'm the pastor. The reason I don't tell them I'm the pastor, I'd love for them to walk in and get shocked. But other than that, I don't invite people to church because I'm the pastor. I invite people to church so that they can make a connection with God. Doesn't matter who's preaching. Brenda, I listened to her message about encountering. I, I joined you all online last Sunday and listened to her talking about encountering God and, and how to do that. And I, I was a part of the worship, a part of the, the message. So it doesn't matter who's speaking. We all get a chance to encounter God when we show up at church. So I just wanted to remind you of all of that. And so now I'm going to talk about somebody I bet you never would have thought I'd talk about. Hey, I, I talked about Snoop Dogg the other day, so you can't ever tell who I might talk about. I'm going to talk about a guy by the name of Jen, a uh, uh, Penn Gillette. I don't know how many of you know who Penn is. He is a part of a uh, 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 illusionist comedy team called Penn and Teller. If you've ever seen them, uh, they're like this, you know. Teller is this tall, Penn is this tall. Teller never speaks, and he's usually the one who uh, uh, is, is in the most dangerous parts of the, of the program. Penn is the one who always speaks. Now, I don't know 
since I've never heard Teller talk, I don't know if he has any faith at all or anything like that. But what I do know about Penn is this. Penn Gillette is a crude, cussing, devoted atheist. He hates all religion, but I believe he hates Christianity the most. So my question for us today, and the question you may be asking, is what in the world could a devoted atheist like Penn Gillette possibly say to those of us who follow Christ? Well, I'm glad you asked that question. Listen to what Penn has to say. And he walked over to me and he said, um, I was here last night at the show and uh, uh, I saw the show and I liked it and I wanted, and he was very complimentary about my use of language and um, complimentary about, you know, honesty and stuff. He said nice stuff, no reason to go into it. He said nice stuff. And then he said, I brought this for you. And he handed me a uh, Gideon pocket edition. Um, I thought it said from the New Testament, but I also thought it was Psalms from the New Testament, right? Or, uh, Psalms from the New, just part of the New Testament. A little book about this big, this thick, you know. He said, I wrote in the front of it, and I wanted you to have this. I'm kind of, uh, proselytizing and then he said I'm a businessman I'm I'm sane I'm not crazy and he looked me right in the eye and did all of this and uh, it was really wonderful I believe he knew that I was an atheist But he was not uh, defensive, and he looked me right in the eyes. And he was truly complimentary. It wasn't in any way, it didn't seem like empty flattery. He was really kind and nice and sane and looked me in the eyes and talked to me and then gave me this Bible. And I've always said, you know, that I, I don't respect people who don't proselytize. I don't respect that at all. If you believe that there's a heaven and hell and people could be going to hell or not getting eternal life or whatever, and you think that, uh, well, it's not really worth telling them this because it would make it socially awkward. And atheists who think that people shouldn't proselytize, just leave me alone, keep your religion to yourself. Uh, how much do you have to hate somebody to not proselytize? How much do you have to hate somebody to believe that everlasting life is possible and not tell them that? I mean, if I believed beyond a shadow of a doubt that a truck was coming at you and you didn't believe it, but that truck was bearing down on you, there's a certain point where I tackle you. And this is more important than that. And I've always thought that, and I've written about that, and I've thought of it conceptually. This guy was a really good guy. He was polite and honest and sane, and he cared enough about me to proselytize and give me a, a Bible, which had written in it a little note to me, uh, not very personal, but just, you know, like to show and so on. And then like five phone numbers for him and an email address if I wanted to get in touch. Ken used the word proselytize, and um, a better word would be evangelize, share the gospel, give a testimony. And when I first heard that, and he's still a rampant atheist, uh, I'm not encouraging you to watch any of his podcasts or videos that he does outside of his entertainment because it's very crude. Um, 
foul language and stuff like that. But what Penn was talking about is someone sharing Jesus with other people. And just in case you missed the sentence that Penn said about telling other people about Jesus, I want to share it with you again. Hear me now. He says, if you believe that there is a heaven and hell, and people could be going to hell and not getting eternal life or whatever, and you think it's not really worth telling them this because it would make it socially awkward. I don't know if we have this on a, on a line back there, but if we do, put this up. How much do you have to hate somebody to believe that everlasting life is possible and not tell them that? That sentence has been running through my mind since I first heard him say that. How much do you have to hate somebody to believe that everlasting life is possible and not tell them that. Let that sink in for just a minute. We we'll say, well, Pastor Jimmy, I, I don't hate anybody. Well, I'm not questioning whether or not you hate anybody, but I am questioning this. I, mean, I want to ask you the question. Are you tell, if you are a Christ follower, if you are a Christ follower, are you telling people about the Jesus you follow? Are you doing that? I want, to, I want to invite you to do something. Imagine that I had the cure to cancer. Imagine that I had that knowledge. It's, there's no doubt about it. It is the real cure, 100%. No doubt about it. I could give you the cure for cancer. Now, there's no doubt that it would work on anyone... There's no doubt that everyone, regardless of your age, regardless of your, your social standing, regardless of your wealth, regardless of your nationality, regardless of your language that you speak, regardless of the color of your skin, whatever it is, whoever you are, this cure for cancer would work on you. Well, now I want you to imagine that you are a loved one that you have has cancer. What would you think of me if I had the knowledge to cure the cancer that you or your loved one has and I didn't share it with you? If I had that kind of news and I didn't share it, wouldn't you think that I hated other people? Wouldn't you think that I didn't care if they died or not? Wouldn't you think that I didn't care anything about them? If I had this cure and I kept it to myself. If you thought that of me because I had a cure for an ailment that would simply extend our lives, but we would still die, then what must you think of someone who has the information about the saving grace of Jesus Christ and never shares that story? Listen, one out of every one people die. So we're all going to face that. My question is, what happens afterwards? What, 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 what are we doing to help people understand about where, what the next step is? What are we doing to introduce them to Jesus? Listen, good news is meant to be shared. We are saved in order to have a relationship with Christ and to tell other people about Christ. Those two things go hand in hand. And I, 
my wife and I took a few days this past week, and, and we were visiting in Savannah, Georgia. And as we were visiting in Savannah, Georgia, we went to this huge um, fountain, you know, just right there. It's, if you've ever seen pictures, you've seen the picture of this white fountain. So we were there, and it's got the sidewalks leading up to it, and this, this three or four ladies were out there, and they were riding on the sidewalk, and they were, you know, you know don't eat meat, you know, kind of messages, you know. And uh, I, I leaned over to my wife, and I'm going to say, should I go over there and tell them I'm, a, I'm kind of a second-degree vegetarian? I, I eat the meat, and my meat eats the vegetables. You know, I'm, I'm just two degrees off. And she said, I don't think you ought to do that. Uh, uh, but but I, was, I was watching them, and you know, I, I just found it very interesting. They were riding on the with sidewalk chalk, and, and then in great big letters... I was watching this one lady, and she wrote in these great big letters, I thought she wrote witch. I thought that's what she wrote. And then uh, it looked like it from where I was sitting, and then, uh, and then the next word she wrote in great big letters was game changers, witch game changers. And I leaned at my wife. I said, I think I need to go tell her about Jesus. <laughs> So I stood up and I was, you know, I kind of was walking around and what I didn't see was the rest of the letter. It said, watch game changers, not which game changers. I'm thinking, this is kind of, we're fixing to be in a different kind of battle today, you know. But my thoughts were, I didn't, you know, we didn't have a chance to interact, but my thoughts were, if she is following that kind of darkness, not the vegan part, no. <laughs> I'm talking the witch part. If she's following that and I have the message that she needs to hear, how much do I have to hate her not to tell her? Every Christ follower is to be a bearer of the good news of the saving grace of Jesus Christ. I want to say that again. Every Christ follower Every, did you hear that part? Every Christ follower is to be a bearer of the good news of the saving grace of Jesus Christ. Notice what Peter said. Peter, the loudmouth disciple of Jesus, listen, in his first book in, in the New Testament, Peter writes this, but in your hearts revere Christ as Lord. Listen to what he says. Always be prepared. You've heard this before from me. Always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give the reason for the hope that you have. But do this with gentleness and respect. Always be prepared. See, it's not a Christ follower's job to save people. That's not our job. It's a Christ follower's responsibility to make the introduction. That's it. That's what we're to do. Have you ever paid attention to the people who encountered Jesus in the Scriptures and started following Him? Go back and read uh, the four Gospels. And pick up on the people that had an encounter with Jesus and they started following him. And I want you to notice what they tell other people about Jesus. If you go to, to uh, uh, John chapter 4, Jesus has this encounter with this Samaritan woman at the well. And, and you, I'm not going to read the whole story to you. Uh, you can read that in John chapter 4. But as you read about it, and, and Jesus has this encounter with her, he changes her life. And you know what she does? She goes back to the, into town, and she starts telling people, she said, come and meet the man who told me everything I ever did. Then if you go on to John chapter 9, Jesus comes by this blind man. This blind man who had been blind from birth, and he healed them. And these religious people are trying to, uh, uh, you know, get the story out of this man. And they keep trying to trap him. They keep trying to get him to tell uh, them that Jesus is a bad guy, that he's a sinner, and all of that. And you know what he says? He says, listen, all I know is that I once was blind, but now I see. And a man named Jesus did it. 
Then if you go over into Mark chapter 5, Jesus, meets, Jesus goes to this cemetery. He meets this man who was possessed of many demons. As a matter of fact, Mark 5 calls him legions. He, there were so many demons in him. And Jesus casts the demons out until the, the pigs and the pigs run off the cliff and into the sea. And, and that happens. And then he wants to follow Jesus. And Jesus says, no, I want you to go back. And I want you to go back where you're from. And you know what he does? He goes back. And he would tell everyone who would listen how much Jesus had done for him. Are you noticing a pattern? Are you noticing the pattern of these folks who are talking to people about Jesus? This, this theme throughout all of these stories. These people, they don't go around quoting scripture. There's nothing wrong with that. I quote scripture, I read scripture, it's important that, you know, that I have it in my heart and my life. But they don't go around quoting scripture. These people don't go around giving a lesson on theology. They are not, de they are not debating with someone the eschat eschatological ramifications and revelation. They're just not doing that. You know what they're doing? They are telling other people what Jesus had done for them. That's it. It's not that complicated. If you are a Christ follower and Christ has saved you and redeemed you, all he's asking you to do is tell somebody else what he did for you. You know who's the greatest authority on you? You. You are the greatest authority on yourself. Listen, don't miss this. When you are introducing people to Jesus, all you're doing is telling them what Christ has done for you and that what he did for you, he will do for them. That's it. It's not any more complicated than that. So good news is meant to be shared. Also, we need to remember that we are not alone. You are not alone when you introduce people to Jesus. You've heard me talk about my trip, my mission trip to the Dominican Republic. And as we were down there, uh, you've heard me share with, with you before that I was a scrub nurse for surgery. And I, know, I understand your trepidation on that. Uh, those folks didn't speak English, so, you know, they were cool with it. They didn't know. I didn't know what I was doing. Uh, uh, but what is very interesting, I still don't know how to do surgery. I, I, I've, you know, I've got a whole week's worth of experience. <laughs> I still don't know how to do surgery. And up to this point, the closest thing I had ever come to doing surgery was cleaning the deer after I shot it. Or cleaning the fish after I'd caught it. The fish and the deer did not survive. <laughs> they didn't. I had these doctors that were down there. And they, these doctors who knew how to do surgery, they trained me for a few minutes. And then we walked into our first surgical procedure. And, and I assisted before, I had, I had all of five minutes of training before I assisted with my very first surgery. And my training was very simple. They said, hand me stuff I ask you for, and if you're not doing anything, place your hands on the edge of the bed. That's the sterile part, you know. Other than that, don't do anything. Well, I can follow, I've been married long enough, I can follow instructions. She'll be at the second service. We might not use that one. Uh, so, but what is interesting, listen, they told me exactly what to do, and they told me exactly when to do it when I was doing surgery. Excuse me, assisting with surgery. <laughs> and, and if I had questions, they were ready to answer those questions. Listen, don't miss this. It, is not my, it was not my job to know how to do the surgery. It was my job to assist the doctors who were doing the surgery. I had the joy and privilege of doing, I don't know, 10, 12, 15 surgeries, of being a part of that many surgeries down there. 
in the DR. And, and all the patients fared much better than the deer and the fish. All of them. As a Christ follower, you are never going to share your faith alone. Let me tell you who's going to be with you. Let's go to Acts chapter 1. Listen to what Jesus is telling his disciples. He said, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. He said, you're not doing this by yourself. Even when you are telling your story about what Christ has done for you, you are not alone. Every Christ follower, follower in here, have you ever, when you've been talking to someone, have you ever felt that prompting, that, that feeling that you need to say something to them about God, say something to them about Jesus, or invite them to church, or something like that? Do you know where that prompting and that, that, that feeling, that, that urging comes from? It does not come from Satan, because he don't want to get people in church, and he don't want to get people saved, all right? When you're feeling that, that's not of Satan, that's of the Lord, that's the Holy Spirit nudging you and encouraging you and saying, hey, invite them to church. Hey, tell them what, what Jesus did for you. That's him working in you to talk to them. So guess what? When you're feeling that, you are not alone. He is right there with you. He is there with you to guide you. See, it's not, I want to say it again, it's not the Christ follower's job to save people. That is beyond our ability we can't do that. It is our job to make the introduction and let God do the saving. The results are up to Him. The results are none of your business. Okay? I mean that in the most loving way that can sound. <laughs> it's not. Your business is to make the introduction. Let God deal with the rest. And you're not alone because the Holy Spirit will be with you and He will give you what you need to say, when you need to say it, and how you need to say it. He will be there with you. All you have to do is trust in Him and obey when He tells you to speak. Notice what Jesus said to his disciples in Matthew. Matthew says this, Then he said to his disciples, he said, The harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Ask the Lord of the harvest, therefore, to send out workers into his harvest field. Jesus is saying there's not enough people telling other people about me. We need more. We need more. We need more people who say they're following me, Jesus says, to tell other people that they're following me. We need more people making these introductions. There's a whole host of people who are dying and going to hell every day. I wonder how many of those people that you and I have encountered we had an opportunity to at least tell them about a Jesus who loves them. Whether or, not they, whether or not they accepted him, that's on them, not on me, not on you. I'm not asking how big is your harvest. I'm, actioning, I'm asking you and I'm asking myself, how faithful are we at planning? How faithful are we at giving the seed out? How faithful are we at telling people about Jesus? See, I think we need to be like one of Jesus' disciples. I want to challenge each one of us today to dare to be an Andrew. Dare to be an Andrew. How many of you, well, I'm not going to ask you to raise your hand, but answer this. How many of you know that Jesus had a disciple besides Peter, James, and John? You might know the other number, you know, there's 12 of them, but how many of you know about Andrew? Listen, I'll tell you a little bit about Andrew. Andrew was a fisherman by trade. Andrew, he sat under the teaching of John the Baptist before he started following Jesus. 
Have you ever noticed in the book, in the Bible, there's no book of Andrew? <laughs> he didn't write any books that are in the New Testament. Not a one. Andrew was one of the 12 main disciples of Jesus. He was the brother of the big mouth. You know, Simon Peter. He was his brother. Andrew was the first disciple Jesus called and the first disciple to claim that Jesus is the Messiah. First one. And despite his seemingly unimportant role, or excuse me, his seemingly important role in the, uh, as an early follower of Christ, Andrew's only mentioned 12 times in the New Testament. And four of those times are simply a list of, of the 12 disciples. He comes in, onto the scene early in the Gospels, but from what we see, he only plays a minor role. However, his prominence in the list of disciples and the few glimpses that we see of him seemed to suggest that he was one of the main disciples. He, even if he wasn't one of the pillars of the church like Peter and James and John, he was still one of the main disciples. And while we don't know a lot about Andrew, there's one thing that Andrew does that I think it is vital for us not only to know, but to imitate. Andrew introduced people to Jesus. And you'll notice Andrew did not have deep theological discussions with all these folks. He did not start quoting, you know, the Old Testament to them. He did not, you know, start talking about how, hey, listen, I'm one of the 12, you know, I'm the one you ought to listen to. You know, he didn't do any of that kind of stuff. He just introduced people to Jesus. Look at this. As soon as Andrew met Jesus, the first person he introduced to Jesus was his brother Peter. First one. Look at it in John chapter 1. It says, Andrew, Simon Peter's br brother, was one of the two who heard what John had said and who had followed Jesus. The first thing Andrew did was to find his brother Simon and tell him, We have found the Messiah. That is the Christ. And he brought him to Jesus. He was so excited. The first person he wanted to tell was his loudmouth brother. He said, we found him. Come on, man. And he introduces Peter to Jesus. On another occasion, Jesus had been teaching thousands of people. And they were out, and they had been out there so long, and it was supper time. And, and Jesus, you know, told the disciples, you need to feed these people. And no one but Andrew offered a solution. You know what Andrew did? He found this little boy who had a couple of small fish and some crackers and brought him to Jesus. He said, well, here you go, Jesus. Now, I don't know if Andrew, I, I, I'm, well, let me back up. I'm pretty sure Andrew had no clue as to what Jesus was getting ready to do. To take a little boy's lunch and feed thousands and have 12 baskets left over. All Andrew knew is that this little boy had something he was willing to give. And there was Jesus who could do something with it. And he made the introduction. That's it. And then he got out of the way and he saw what God could do. Look at what John said. Another of his disciples, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, spoke up. Here is a boy with five small barley loaves and two small fish. How far will they go to so many? Andrew didn't know. <laughs> but he knew Jesus could do something with it. There's another time where Andrew, uh, one of the other disciples, Philip, he brought a group of Greeks to Andrew. And notice what happens in John chapter 
12. Now, we're, now, now there were some Greeks among them who went up to worship at the festival. They came to Philip, who was from Bethsaida in Galilee, with a request. Sir, they said, we would like to see Jesus. Philip went to tell Andrew, and catch this, Andrew and Philip in turn told Jesus. Hey, Jesus, there's these Greeks who want to talk to you. And you know what they did then? They got out of the way. They let Jesus do his thing. See, I believe that the most significant thing that Andrew is known for in his life was loving and following Jesus and introducing people to Jesus. In 1873, a banyan tree was imported from India and it was planted in front of the courthouse in Lahaina, Maui. The tree was eight foot tall when it was planted. Now, 150 years later, the tree is 60 feet tall, has 47 trunks, and covers two acres. You see, uh, back it up one. You see, that's the courthouse in La Haina, that house in the middle of the picture. That's one tree behind it. Did you hear that? That is one tree behind it. Its circumference is about a quarter of a mile. It, 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 a thousand people could gather under the tree and get in its shade. Anita and I had the privilege of standing under this tree during our 40th anniversary trip to Hawaii. Only time we've ever been to Hawaii. And it was amazing. Show the next slide. What you have there is the main trunk of the tree. That's where the eight-foot tall banyan tree was planted. And that's part of its trunk from 150 years ago. Show the next slide. You can see coming out from that tree, from that root, how it's coming out and going all over the place. You see all the, all the limbs and you see all the, the places that, that that is growing. And it's an amazing tree. And, and, and the way this banyan tree has been able to grow from 8 feet tall to 60 feet tall, it is the largest tree in the United States. And the way it started as an 8 foot tall tree and has gone out is as the tree began to grow, it would go out so far and it would set down another root. Show the next one. And what you see here is how the roots have come up and they will go out so far in the limb and then they'll set down another root and it'll grow down and it'll grow out. And as you walk throughout this park, you see that happening from the base of the tree coming out, going down, Setting a root and then going out and it goes out so far and it goes down and sets another root and goes out so far and it keeps doing this for over two acres. This process has been going on for 150 years. See, this tree is a picture of what we are supposed to do as Christ followers. Every Christ follower is supposed to stay connected to Jesus. And then we are, you know, Jesus is the main source of our life. And then we are to receive nourishment from him. We are to receive strength from him. And then while staying connected to Jesus, we are to go out and start growing outward and placing down new roots. And those new roots are people we're introducing to Jesus. And we keep doing that. And then the, whenever we help them place new roots, they then stay connected to Jesus. They're the source of their life. They then start spreading out and going out.
That's all we are to do as Christ followers is to tell, to tell others about Jesus. A couple of years ago, I shared a message about introducing others to Jesus. And after that message, we gave everyone who would take it a, about a 10-inch long piece of red yarn. And what I ask everybody to do is to take that and that one piece of yarn and tie five, at least five knots in it. Each knot represents someone that you know that does not know Jesus and that you're going to be praying for them and doing what you can to help them come to Jesus. Well, I did the same thing I asked you to do. I try not to do something, ask you to do something, me not do it. I took two cords and I made ten knots. And I've prayed over these folks and prayed for them. Just over a week ago, one of the ones I had been praying for died. She was a cousin of mine that I grew up with, and I, I honestly, we, we haven't spoken in years. And she's the one, one of, the one, one of my knights I was praying for. Her younger brother is a, uh, is a Christ follower, and he sent me this message. He said, I had the opportunity to pray with Karen and ask if she had everything right with God. And she told me that she had asked for forgiveness for everything. That was my assurance that she was right with God. Her brother did not know that I'd been praying for Karen. See, Karen waited until it was almost too late. What if her brother had not been there? What if he had not... Uh, it, what, if she, what if she had not had one more opportunity to invite Jesus into her heart? Then she would be spending eternity in hell forever separated from the God who did all he could to keep her out of hell. So what are we as Christ followers doing to tell other people about Jesus? How are we growing the kingdom? How are we introducing people to Jesus? What are we doing? The words of Penn Jillette are still running through my mind and have been for a long time. How much do you have to hate somebody to believe that everything, that everlasting life is possible and not tell them that? At the end of every one of my sermons, I offer people an opportunity to accept Jesus. And if God gives me the breath to, breath to keep preaching, I'm going to keep offering. And if you are here today and you do not know Jesus as your Savior, I'm going to share real briefly the plan of salvation. And I hope those of you who don't know Him, that today will be the day you accept Him. But whether or not you accept Him, that's between you and, and God. But I do know that after today, you cannot say you've never heard it. You will not be able to stand before God with no excuse. So let me tell you, very simply as I can, Christ Jesus came to this earth. He was born as a baby. He lived a life on this planet. For just over 33 years. The last three of his years he spent telling other people about God. And about what he was going to do. He, he did that his whole life. But we know the last three years how he told people about God. And he said I've come that I, can, I would die for you. And he went to the cross. And he took your sins and my sins on him on the cross. He, was, he died fully. There's no question of what, whether or not he died. He, he was dead. They took him off the cross. They placed him in a tomb. And on the third day, he arose again. And whenever he came back to life, and whenever he was raised again, he came back with the assurance for you that your sins are forgiven. 
that you need not fear death, hell, or the grave because he's already defeated them. And he wants to give you life. Will you accept it? Will you accept his salvation gift he's given to you? Everybody, will you bow your heads? As we're getting ready to pray, I want to remind you, I never will intentionally embarrass anybody. But what I will do is invite you to come to Christ. And as you are thinking about what Christ would have you do, as you're thinking about this invitation that He is offering, I want to ask you, will you give your life to Him? Will you surrender your life to Christ right now? You can do that in a very simple way. You can begin a relationship with Jesus by praying this very simple prayer. You will acknowledge your sin, ask for forgiveness, receive, ask Him to come into your life and receive Christ. Will you pray this very simple prayer? You can remember it with these four very simple words. The first one is sorry. God, I'm sorry for what I've done wrong. I'm sorry for the sin in my life. I'm sorry I have rejected you up to this point. The next word is please. Please forgive me of my sins. Please come into my life. Please save me. And please become the Lord of my life. And the last two words are thank you. Thank you for loving me. Thank you for saving me. Thank you for forgiving me. Thank you for never giving up on me. Thank you. Father, for those who have prayed that prayer for the first time today in minute, we give thanks and we rejoice over the fact that they have made a decision to follow you and give their whole heart and their whole life to you today. We rejoice with all the angels in heaven as they are rejoicing over this decision made to follow you. For them and for the rest of us, Father, I pray that we would get to know you better and love you more. I pray that we would just continue to realize that as we walk in this life, we are not alone. We are guided and directed by the Holy Spirit and you are with us. And may we as Christ's followers, may we love people enough to tell them about the saving grace of Jesus Christ. In your name I pray. Amen. We always open this altar up. We're going to continue to do that. If you would like for me to pray with you, or if you'd like for, uh, you know, to... For us to have that some time together in prayer, I just simply ask you to get my attention. If you don't get my attention, I will not bother you. But if you'd like for me to, I'll be glad to pray with you. Just let me know. Do you need to come to faith? If you already have faith, is there somebody you need to pray for that doesn't have a relationship with Jesus? I still got some knots in my string. I'm going to spend a little time praying for them today. I want to invite you to come and do the same thing. As you're able, will you please stand? And as you stand, and as we sing this next song, this altar is open for you. If you're troubled,
if you're wandering in the darkness come to Jesus and find your the prince of peace author and maker of everything defender deliverer king of kings he is he is helper and healer forevermore savior and shelter through every storm my refuge redeemer and lord of lords he is he is child of heaven and son of man protector the great i am alpha omega beginning and end he is he is hope for the hopeless rest for the weary help for the hurting he is he is mending the broken bearing the burden all that you need let us know how we can help you with your walk with Jesus if you got questions that's okay we do too we just seek the answers and just you know we're there for you let us know how we can help you out talk to any one of us on staff talk to me at, at, at you know uh, email me jimmy at woodbine church uh, dot org grab my uh, business card it's got my cell phone on there you know my email everything we want to help you with your walk with Christ uh, I want to invite everybody to be seated for just a moment. I want to invite Heather to come on up here for just a second. And uh, Candy, can we borrow your microphone? Come on up here, too. Yeah, I know you're excited about this. So thank you. You can stay up here with us if you want to, Candy. You're just almost there. One more step. All right. <laughs> Uh, two things that these ladies are going to do, but before they do that, if you are new here, or if you've been here before and I hadn't met you, I would love to visit with you. I'll be outside these doors, hang a left, over here by the couch, drop in and see me. Let's get to know each other, and I appreciate that very much. Uh, Heather is going to talk to us about a great opportunity called Rooted. So, Hi, good morning. Um, so Rooted is a new ministry that we're going to um, start to support our youth during middle school and high school. Um, what you'll do is you'll walk beside them showing God's love, grace, and mercy. And um, we'll do this by providing Christian nourishment for them, strength, and stability in their lives. Our goal is to help them become more mature in their walk with Christ. So the meeting next week will have more information and there will be a form to fill out. Um, so we'll match you with the youth. And then I do want to let you know that because we are going to be interacting with the youth, there will be a background check that is required. Um, so come next week between the services, and I will give you some more information about what we're going to be doing. Thank you, Heather. This is he Heather Nickery, and uh, be sure to um, uh, you know talk to her about that. That's next Sunday between services. Uh, as just this is another tool in our youth ministry uh, arsenal to help uh, teach kids to know and love Jesus. So, and, and I know Miss Candy has got an invitation. Hi, everybody. Um, I usually work with the kids, so you don't usually see me in here, but two weeks from today, we are going to be having practice and auditions for our Christmas play for the kids. It's going to be a really funny one. Um, I'm really excited about it. It's actually a play play. It's not more than a musical, but we really would love to have attendance this year. We really need a lot of players. There's
there's like 19 roles, and um, I have envisioned and have been praying over the kids that I think would be perfectly suited for those roles. So if you guys could come, it's after second service, two weeks from today at 1230. We're going to be doing about 1230 to 130. So I hope that the kids get involved, and I hope that you guys are excited because this is just one more way that we can actually invite people during the Christmas season when people are really, really wanting to know God and have that spiritual um, enlightenment, so to speak. So please, please, please come. All right, and uh, Candy, what, what are the ages that you're looking for? What age group? Kids. All the way up, all the way up to kids. Fifth grade, okay. All kids. Um, no, so we're even we're even Jesus's willing we're even u- willing to use some of the youth because um, there are a lot of parts in here, okay. um, and there are a lot of speaking parts, and so we're willing to just take all of them, just all of them. All right. So kids. if you so haven't kids. graduated from high school kids. yet, talk to Candy. Yes. Does that work? Yes. Okay. All right. Uh, well, Miss Chrissy, I'm going to invite her to uh, close us in prayer. Uh, again, thank you so much for being here. Let us know how we can help you in your walk with Jesus and uh, any questions you may have. And I want to invite you as we get ready to close, will you please stand, Miss Chrissy? Heavenly Father, we just thank you so much once again for the, for the gift of your son. And what a wonderful reminder today in the word, Lord, that keeping that gift to ourselves, Father, is, is just not acceptable. Lord, we've got to get out there and share this good news so that we can bring people into relationship with you, or at least introduce them, as Jimmy says, and then leave that relationship to you. Father, give us courage and boldness, Lord, because there's nothing more important, nothing more important, Lord, than the salvation of the lost. So, Father, I just ask for the strength and the courage of each and every one of your of, of your followers, Lord, that we would just have a renewed just determination to bring the good news to everyone, Father, and then let you work in their lives. We love you, Father. We thank you for this word today. We thank you for that chance to come together and lift up your name in praise. And Father, just ask that you would be this with us in this coming week, and, and we would be excited about the opportunities you give us. In your son's precious and holy name, amen. Have a good day.